In this lecture, we're looking at Thomas Aquinas in the shape of his theological thinking. And we want to begin by just noting the importance of Aquinas. In the context of the Middle Ages, it's hard to find anyone who surpasses Thomas Aquinas for both his prolific output and for the importance of what he has to say on, frankly, just about any doctrine or any topic that was in play in the Middle Ages. Again, it's almost impossible to be hyperbolic. Aquinas just is that important. Now, for Protestants, it is pretty well known that Luther rejected Thomas Aquinas, that he thought rather low of his theology. But really, this is an overplayed point. It needs to be pointed out that Luther had some negative things to say about Aquinas, but he had a number of things negative to say about the entirety of medieval scholasticism. And whenever Luther pulled out the clause, and whenever he went after medieval scholastics, he often went after Aristotle and the over-reliance on reason alone in terms of theological thinking. Aquinas really isn't the boogeyman here. He's not the one who tipped the scales and ruined the medieval church. Even if you take a relatively negative view of the scholastic world, and I don't, you still can't pin all of the faults or all of the excesses in terms of Aristotelian thinking on just one man. And besides, both in Lutheranism and in Calvinism, as well as in the English-speaking world, within two generations of the Reformation, you have a return to Aristotelian and even Thomistic thinking in the rise of what we call Protestant scholasticism. So even within the Protestant heritage, there is a return to medieval thinking, a return to some of the categories, some of the attempts to wrestle with the question of faith and reason. And even if Protestant theology obviously is resting on a different foundation, and it has a number of different perspectives on any number of doctrines, still, the issue is not scholasticism per se, or Aquinas himself, but rather how we appropriate them into our overall theological vocabulary. In terms of Western theology, in terms of the development of scholasticism within the Catholic Church, there is none, frankly, greater than Aquinas in the Middle Ages. And so, in this lecture, we're going to begin by noting his life and his influence, and then we're going to turn to his overall theological approach to things, and in particular to the issue of faith and reason. Thomas Aquinas was born to a rather lower noble house in the area of Aquino, down in the southern part, in, if you want to look at it as a boot, down in the lower shin portion of the Italian peninsula. And this is important to note, Aquinas does actually come from a rather well-to-do family. Again, he's not at the higher levels. His family is not the most important family in the Italian states in general, but rather they are of a relatively lower rank. Aquinas' mother does come from a higher noble house, but the family itself from the area of Okino was itself relatively minor. Thomas' father was the duke there of the area of Okino, and so he had a great deal of ambition for his sons. And right away, we can notice one of the more interesting features about Aquinas. Not a few students have noted that when we refer to the theology or the philosophy of Thomas, that we call it Thomism. I can count on multiple hands the number of times a student has asked me, why don't we refer to it as Aquinoism or something like this? Why do we refer to it after his first name? Well, the answer is, again, because he comes from a noble family, because he is from the region of Aquino, that really is not his proper name. Aquinas is a marker of his birth, not of his name itself. And so whenever we refer to Thomism, we are referring to the theology of Thomas, Thomas being that guy who happens to come from the area of Aquino. So what we're talking about in this lecture is Thomism, the theology of this man. But he was from a noble house. In fact, one of the more interesting connections from this family from Aquino is the fact that Thomas's uncle was, at the time of his birth, the abbot of Monte Cassino. You'll recall from our lecture on monasticism that Monte Cassino was the first Benedictine abbey. In many ways, it is the first real major push in the West to develop a Cenobitic monastic order. That is to say, a monastic house where you have a number of people living in community together, rather than the Aramedical or the hermit tradition that you often found out in the East. So Monte Cassino is monastic royalty, if you want to coin a phrase. 
It is, in many ways, the wellspring of the Western impulse here. Well, you'll recall, as we said in our last lecture under Bernard, that from the 11th century on, there was a great deal of rot in some of these old monastic houses. So much money, so much power, so much influence meant that noble houses often lobbied for their sons or their extended family members to take up residence at times as abbots, sometimes just as high-ranking members of certain houses in order to curry favor and influence over a wealthy district controlled by the church. Well, in this case, you have exactly this. Thomas's uncle is the abbot of Monte Cassino, a vitally important monastery there in Italy, and certainly a vitally important monastery for Europe as a whole. Aquinas was born in 1225, and he had a number of brothers. His father, the Count, though, seemed to have been pushing his brothers for preferment or advancement in their careers through the military arts. So they would be trained and horseback riding and fighting and these kinds of things. For Thomas, there was the hope that he would become, like his uncle before him, a powerful abbot there at Monte Cassino. From the age of five, Thomas is sent off, in fact, to the city of Naples, and then on to another university setting entirely, in order to achieve high marks and high status from a very young age in terms of his Latin and his proficiency, so that when he then joined the monastic orders, he would have a leg up. So from the beginning, Thomas is being put forward for the real stately, traditional monastic wing of the Catholic Church, the Benedictine wing, the Benedictine order. There was one problem, though. There was this new group of monks on the horizon, just recently established officially, meaning recognized by the Pope, was a group known as the Dominicans. And the Dominicans come from St. Dominic himself. Dominic was a powerful figure, a well-respected figure, who was a bit of a heresy hunter. St. Dominic, the founder of the Dominicans, had been really instrumental in the Albigensian Crusade. And we had mentioned this during our lectures on the Crusades. This heretical movement, this neo-Gnostic movement there in the southern part of France, St. Dominic gets them in his crosshairs, and he goes after them. As a result of Dominic's theological bent and his, you might say, more apologetic tone to the founding of his monastic group, Dominic envisioned a monastic order that would be the lead dog, you might say, the lead group when it came to theological reflection, scholasticism, and the defense of true doctrine against false teaching. And that really is what becomes of the Dominicans. However, by Aquinas' youth, and by the time he begins to decide what he wants to do with his life, the Dominicans were relatively new. The Dominicans had only been officially recognized by the Pope in 1216. Aquinas, born 1225. These are, you might say, the new kids on the block. The Dominicans are the new, more feisty, real, committed, serious-minded monks that are on the rise in the 13th century. And they took it as part of their self-identity, the Dominicans did, that they would be leading intellectuals in their communities. That they would take very seriously their theology. And, more importantly, that they would take seriously the call to preach the gospel. Not just to edify those who were of the church, but also to preach against false teaching wherever they may find it. In fact, to this day, if you see someone who is a Dominican, you will see the initials after their name, O.P., which in Latin almost literally carries over to the anglicizing of this, means the order of preachers. O.P., Dominicans are the order of the preachers. They are supremely gifted, historically speaking, at intellectual prowess, preaching, and defending the truth. Now, there's a little bit of an urban legend out there. Sometimes people are told that Dominicans gets its name from a really bad pun. Dominicanis in Latin means the hounds of God, or the Lord's dogs, you might say. Domini is a conjugation of dominus, which is where we get the word Lord. Canis is the Latin word for dogs. This is a pun. This is a bad pun. Just goes to show that theologians have been making bad puns all throughout history. But this is not the origin of the name Dominicans. It comes from St. Dominic. But their essence, in many ways, actually lives up to that pun. Over the centuries, they really are the hounds of heaven. They really are 
tenacious in a feisty sort of way over time. Not in a nasty, brutish kind of way, but it is their call to preach and to be leading intellectuals in Europe. Well, as it happens, Thomas decides at the age of 19 that he's not going to go for the more posh and pleasant and easy lifestyle of the Benedictine order there at Monte Cassino. And he marches into his father's rooms and he announces that he is going to join the Dominicans. Now, the sting of this is this really is a slap in the face. This is, by and large, disowning your family, which in a feudal system is really serious. It's always serious, but particularly in a feudal system if you're part of a noble house. And Aquinas says, I am going to join the Dominicans, which means I am not going to join the historic ties of our family to the Monte Cassino Monastery. And above and beyond that, he is going to join the Dominicans who take a serious and rigorous vow of poverty. As we saw in our lecture with Bernard, the mendicant orders are those who vow to live hand to mouth. They will beg for their food. They will not take endowments or monies and live in opulence. Well, as you can imagine, his father was not very happy. Thomas had arranged to flee to Rome, where he would meet up with the head of the Dominican order, and he would get his marching orders as to where to go from there. The problem, though, is his father was not willing to let Thomas go. And so he had his brothers, Thomas's brothers, kidnap Thomas and lock him up in the family castle. And they didn't just do this, they also tried to tempt him with the pleasures of the flesh. There are stories of them trying to get Thomas drunk. At one point, they send, depending on the account, one or two prostitutes in to try to sleep with Thomas to see if they can break his spirit. And according to tradition, Thomas chases them out, and using a brand from the fire, he scrawls a cross onto the door, warding off their sinful enticements to him and his young 19-year-old flesh. What's going on here? Well, the noble family is thinking, if we can just get him off this rigorous, strangely intense monastic idea that he is going to join this relatively new, intense order called the Dominicans, if they can get him off that, then, well, maybe they'll win him back to the family, back to Monte Cassino, etc. The goal, in other words, is not to make him less of a Christian per se, though, of course, there is some duplicity in the fact that they're sending in prostitutes. They're not trying to make him secular. They're not mad that he's joining the church or the monastery. What they feel affronted with is the fact that he is leaving their family and saying, I'm going my own way. And better to have him addicted to wine, women, and song than to have him run off and leave the family behind. In the end, it's Thomas's mother in 1244 who intervenes. Realizing that the scandal of locking your son up for the rest of his natural life into the castle was not preferable to simply letting him go. And so, in the middle of the night, she allows for a window into his room to be left open, and away he flees. And he escapes, first to Rome, and then on to Paris. Aquinas arrived in Paris in 1245, and he arrived there again as a Dominican with the sole purpose of taking on theological study with one of the leading lights and one of the great theologians of the Middle Ages a man by the name of Albert the Great. It's just a point of historical fact. Anybody who gets the name The Great after their name has done something to merit that. And Albert really had. He was a significantly important and influential scholastic theologian. And he becomes Aquinas' teacher, and eventually the man who puts him forward for advancement in the ranks of teaching. Thomas takes some degrees there at Paris under Albert, he then moves to the city of Cologne, where he begins some level of teaching. He then moves back to Paris, where he is, again, rising up the ranks, achieving his doctorate, etc. He then goes on a bit of a peripatetic lifestyle for a while. He travels down to Naples, then to Rome, then back to Paris, and then back again to Rome in the Italian peninsula at some point. All the while, he's teaching and he's writing. And it should be noted that Aquinas is one of the most prolific medieval theologians of the entirety of these centuries. And in the end, he died. Still relatively only a young man, but by the time of his death, considered to be one of the most important and influential figures already by the end of his own natural life. And as the centuries wore on, the influence and the breadth and the depth of his teaching only carried his legacy even further.
And that legacy continues all the way until the modern world, where there are still people to this day plumbing the depths of what Thomas had to say on all sorts of subjects. Well, what was his philosophy? What was his theology? In our next lecture, we're going to look more in-depthly at his theology. But with the remaining time for this lecture, we want to look at the subject of faith and reason. As we've seen with Abelard and Anselm, and really a number of others, all the way back to the 11th century, the primary question is faith and reason. How do these things hold together? And it really is Aquinas who synthesizes and brings the two subjects of faith and reason together in perhaps the most complete and balanced way of anybody in the Middle Ages. Now, as we'll see in later lectures, there are those who challenge Aquinas on his use of Aristotle. Occam, in particular, is relatively scathing. He pitches himself as the man on the sidelines saying that the emperor has no clothes. But we'll get to that when we get to those lectures. For now, you need to know that Aquinas is considered one of the best synthesizers of the relationship of faith to reason. Well, what is his understanding of these ideas? Well, first and foremost, he begins with Aristotle's definition of knowledge. For Aristotle, knowledge is basically resigned and limited to sensory perceptions. We know things because we experience them. Now, this doesn't mean that either Aquinas or Aristotle are pure materialists. It just means they're not platonic. They don't believe that there is a wellspring of a priori, complex, deductive, almost mystical knowledge that we have in our mind that we receive, say, from the world of the forms. Rather, the things we know, we know because of sensory experience. We know them because we come across them in the context of our life. And from this, Aquinas splits up two categories of knowledge that are vital to understand his, frankly, general approach to theology itself. One of the things we'll see in Aquinas' theology in our next lecture is that he is always careful to balance what is natural and common and just a fact of life, you might say. Things that we know, things that are true, things that are good, that are just simply a part of God's creation. However, on the other hand, we know that because of the nature of faith and what God has wrought in our hearts, there is some new wellspring of information some new wellspring of insight and knowledge that we did not have before. Before, we might believe in a God. Now we know through the scriptures, through meditation, that Christ is Lord, and that opens the door, obviously, to the doctrines of the Trinity, etc. Well, as we've seen all the way down to this lecture, there really were two fundamental traditions that were arising. There were those who were relatively pessimistic about the nature of reason, to really come to much of a conclusion on God at all. They were either obscurantists or they were pessimists when it came to our ability to grasp God apart from faith. This is more in the Augustinian tradition. This is the teachings that we see in Bernard. And these are the folks who say, look, our will is broken. It doesn't matter how much information comes into our noggin. We're going to twist and pervert that truth. And our eyes are blind until our wills are corrected till we have ears to hear and eyes to see through the coming of the gospel and the grace of our Lord into our hearts. The problem with this side, though, is not just that it was obscurantist, but also within this Augustinian tradition, there is a tendency to believe that once you get your will right, once you have come to faith, well, knowledge and all these kinds of things are just only natural. It's more effortless, you might say. Fix the will, fix the direction of our hearts, and knowledge of who God is in and of himself is more or less obvious. Doctrines just leap off the page of Scripture, let's say. There's no hard and deep reflection needed to really ponder these truths any more in-depthly than we see there on the page. On the other side, there were those who were altogether optimistic, and in some cases far too optimistic, when it came to the role of natural reason in understanding these truths. We saw this in particular with the person of Abelard. For these folks, it was more, you might say, a lack of content or a lack of substance in the way our minds and our rational faculties are going to approach the doctrines. They saw it as altogether natural, not tainted by sin, but tainted by a lack of information. And the problem here, though, is, particularly for Abelard, that information is achieved through the contents of our own dialectical reasoning. 
we think deeply, we explore these topics, and we carve out things that we no longer believe based on reason, and we keep the rest. Where Aquinas lands is really in something of a slogan that can be seen as emblematic of everything that Aquinas has to say on a lot of these complex either-or questions. The fundamental root of a lot of what Aquinas has to say about theology or the Bible or on the subject of faith and reason is the slogan that grace perfects nature. For those of you who are first coming to Aquinas, if you get this slogan and if you understand what it means, you've come a long way to really grasping what Aquinas is attempting to do in terms of his methodology and in terms of his theology itself. Grace perfecting nature, not obliterating nature and not simply improving through some new energy, you might say, the greatness of nature itself. Grace perfecting nature. In other words, where Aquinas is going to come from is he's going to look at the problem of sin, but he's also going to affirm that in our natural capacities as the image of God, as God's creation, that our goodness and our natural qualities were not obliterated because of sin. Rather, they were tainted because of sin. And that really is the fundamental problem. Everyone who reads the scriptures realizes that there is something in all of us, all of humanity, Christian or not, that has a capacity for natural thinking, reasoning. I mean, you don't have to be a Christian to be a scientist, for example. You don't have to be a Christian to be a philosopher. You don't have to be a Christian to have wisdom in a fundamental sense. Aquinas says nature has a lot to offer. It is God's creation. We are his image. We're not troglodytes. Heavy mouth breathers who know nothing until faith comes into us and suddenly we are smart people. Christians don't believe that everyone is dumb except for them. However, for Aquinas, nature on its own is imperfect. It is tainted. It can't be left to its own devices to discover who God is fundamentally in and of himself. And that, for Aquinas, is the role of grace. Grace comes into the natural thing and, you might say, infuses it. I don't think salvation here. Think in terms of grace animating and giving new life and the full purpose of what nature was intended to be. So let's take our minds. Let's take faith and reason. And again, we're going to look at this same grace perfecting nature move in our next lecture when we look at more substantive issues in Aquinas' theology. But when we look at faith and reason, Aquinas does the same move. He says, our reason is smart. We do have minds. We can think, we can find some arguments that are compelling to argue that God exists, left on their own. There are also laws of nature and truths and all kinds of things, Aquinas says, that we can discover simply by the context of our own natures. Now again, don't read Enlightenment rationalism when he's saying this. We are God's image, we are created to think, we are created to explore to be artists, to be thinkers, to be all kinds of these wonderful things. However, Aquinas is very clear, the limits of reason, the limits of our natures, holds us back to only being able to explore the preambles of the faith. The context, the, the world around us, creation itself, you might say, the preambles. Aquinas says, though, that we need grace itself, we need the faith found in scriptures and illumined in our heart by the Holy Spirit to come along and give us what he calls the mysteries of the faith. So, in the preambles, we can know that someone created this world. We can have rational arguments that there was some creative force behind this, some God, that there is such a thing as goodness, that justice and the common good are things we ought to know and explore. But, Aquinas will say, it takes the eyes of faith illumined in our hearts by the Holy Spirit to be able to even understand the depths of the mysteries of God in the person of Jesus Christ, in the Trinity, the Incarnation, and in the Atonement, etc. In other words, for Aquinas, it's not just that we need more of our intellect, but it's also not just that we need our wills to be corrected so that our intellects can get on with deeper theological thinking. For him, it's both that we need the new direction of faith we need to have a new allegiance to Christ, but also that our faith does give us more content than it had before. It's not just that we get right with God and then our rational minds take over and do the rest, which is probably an overdrawn caricature of where Abelard went, but 
it actually does fit in some ways. He says, we have the eyes of faith, now let's let the mind take over now. Aquinas says, no, grace actually gives us new content as well as a new direction. And therefore, the depth of the mystery of our theological focus will always, always, always be grace that is perfecting nature. The grace of our faith that doesn't leave our intellect or our will to their own devices, but rather comes in and breathes new life into everything about who we are. Thank mm-hmm. you.